First of all, great honor to be here, and I think this conference is extremely timely. There's such an assault on the legitimacy of the State of Israel, the legitimacy of uh, the presence of Jewish people in some parts of the land here, that the starting point has to be the Balfour Declaration. My focus as an international lawyer is the question of title, the issue of sovereignty. And you have to sort of separate that dimension or that perspective from political solutions. What I'm interested in as an international lawyer who's been involved in different things relating to human rights for decades is, is it true that Jewish people in parts of Jerusalem and parts of the Holy Land are thieves, outlaws, trespassers, wrongful settlers? Well, the, the answer to that, if you're a jurist, is that it depends if you're there as a right, if you've been given title, or if you have no title and you're in fact an intruder. Whatever happens next in the realm of negotiations, I think it is essential for Israel, for the Jewish people, to know that they're in this land as of right. The foundation is indeed the Balfour Declaration, but I am so concerned about the lack of knowledge, the lack of understanding among Israelis, within the Israeli government, Jewish people worldwide about their legal rights under international law. And I very much <laughs> am privileged to be associated with uh, the Institute, uh, Ambassador Gold's Institute, because they do so much to try to deal with this shortcoming. So, we referred to this Security Council resolution uh, 2334. Uh, which begins with a reaffirmation of the fact that you can't acquire title or sovereignty by force. You know what? That is a fundamental principle of international law. I agree with that. And so many UN General Assembly resolutions begin with that. Security Council resolutions refer to that. But what if you have title and sovereignty in respect to that territory before you take it by force. Do you understand? I can't disagree that under international law now, you can't get title that way. But what if title was given to you previously? Now I gotta get this thing to work. Here we go. Balfour Declaration. Let me say this right now. Extremely significant. They took the aspirations, the components of the Basel program, and, and what Herzl did that was so significant is that he had a, not only a conference, but he, he articulated the plan to establish what? A legally secured home in a particular place, which was Palestine. Now, the big question is when the declaration came out. It was approved October 31, 1917, sent as a letter November 2, 1917, and published in the newspapers, in the Times and other newspapers in England on November 9, the day after the coup d'etat in Russia. When it was published, the question is, what was Palestine? There was no territory in the Middle East known then as Palestine. The area was Turkish territory, and you see here on the slide this, the, the subdivisions, the regions. So the question is, when the declaration said we're going to give rights to the Jewish people in Palestine, what was meant? Well, I'm showing you a map. I hope you can see this map. You should be aware of this map, because it's very crucial. It's a map of the Holy Land in the days of David and Solomon. I am submitting to you today that this is a fundamental document 
that tells you what Palestine was meant to, by, by the cabinet when the declaration was issued. I'll explain to you why in a moment. So, I'm talking from a legal perspective. How could this be relevant legally? Well, listen to me. In those days, the Holy Land, two people like Lloyd George and, and Balfour, meant biblical lands. And uh, for the French, here's a, a map of La, La Terre Sainte. Again, the French had tons of documentation and maps. Terre Sainte meant the Jewish biblical lands. So when was title given? Paris Peace Conference. We begin with some very crucial events. Six months, Paris, Quai d'Orsay. Here are the four individuals who were the principal allied powers. You have to remember this concept in the presentation of the legal rights. Never forget the importance of the five principal powers. You'll understand why in a minute. So, Paris Peace Conference at the Quai d'Orsay. The uh, two individuals that you see here are involved in making presentations. So if you're presenting a legal case to a court, what you, what you present is a claim. It's, it's not binding, it's what you want. On February 6, the Arabs presented their claim. So little is known about that. I have the minutes of what happened that day. Isn't it relevant that when they talked about the, the areas where independent Arab states should be in, established, they said, not Palestine, we'll leave Palestine to the side. To, but because we, we, don't, we don't claim that that should be an independent Arab state. This is in their presentation, February 6th. Shouldn't you know this? Here we are, February 6th, who's there? Connecting a dot, Balfour, five powers. Here are the five powers you should never forget. US, UK, Italy, France, and Japan. If you ask me why I went to the Japanese parliament to present my work. By the way, if you want to get into the issue of title relating to this land, you'd be better prepared to work for a while. <laughs> That's the result of 20 years of searching for the answer, who's got title to this land? And the conclusion is the Jewish people and the state of Israel. It's in here. It weighs 10 pounds. But uh, if you're going to deal with Jerusalem, you, you can't dabble because it takes forever. It's deep, it's wide, it's complex. Here we are, February 6th, the presentation of uh, one party, one claimant, not Palestinians, the Arabs. Who were the claimants in those days? Jewish people, the Arabs. February 27th, such an important day. You should never forget February 27th. That's when the historic claims were presented by Wiseman, Sokolov, a whole bunch of others. Who's there again? Balfour. What do they want? Recognition of their historic connection with the land. On top of that, they want the right to reconstitute what they used to have. Such an important concept. It's interesting that the Balfour Declaration, one of the drafts by Balfour, included these words, the right to reconstitute. It was rejected by the war cabinet. They're asking for that right to reconstitute at the Paris Conference. What territory? You see a map of, of what was requested. It's basically everything that was significant biblically, the 12 tribes. Covenant of the League of Nations. Next big step is the League of Nations is set up by whom? The five powers. In the covenant, there's a particular article which is key, Article 22. That's where the mandate system is introduced, something brand new in international law. And we're talking here about setting up sacred trusts of civilization. And until there's a final determination relating to the territories called the occupied territories right now, the sacred trust is still relevant and applicable. Article 119 of the Treaty of Versailles. Just showing you that so you begin to understand who got title. If you buy a house, you better make sure the people you buy it from have title, otherwise you don't get title. So what I want to present to you is the fact that the nations that gave title to the Jews and to the Arabs 
receive title. Another treaty where title was given to the five powers. Now, the San Remo Conference. Can you imagine? For 10 years, I've been trying to underline the significance of this conference. Recently in the House of Lords, just a few days after that peculiar meeting, uh, Ambassador. Uh, why is it so important? Because after the claims were presented in the, in the Paris Peace Conference, the Allies, the five powers, didn't make any decisions. They were too busy. They left Paris after six months and reconvened in this city, beautiful city of San Remo in Italy, in this house. You see it in 1919, and then you see it now. I've been there quite a few times, and I can tell you it looks like that. Who was there? They convened in a room and deliberated for two days to decide what are we going to do with the Ottoman territories. After two days, they decide. Here they are, standing in front of the steps. Here's the decision that was made. They take the policy of the Balfour Declaration, which was until then the Declaration of a Nation, which at the time it was made, they didn't have possession even, they didn't have title. Now, they take that and Whereas they're going to be receiving title from the Turks, they turn around and make this decision. Take the words of the Balfour Declaration. This is such a turning point legally in history. And you know what? During this meeting, the French guy says, Palestine, what do you mean? Well, Lord George responds, well, from Dan to Beersheba, of course. And the French guy says, Dan, where's that? Well, I've got the answer. He says, I'm going to show you a map from George Adam Smith, very famous archaeologist, and that's going to be the Palestine that we're going to give to the Jewish people. Minutes of the meeting of the five powers and saying, shouldn't you know about this? This is it. Here's the map. That's why I told you it was relevant, because it is the basis of those discussions. Do you think I'm exaggerating about the importance of the St. Remo Conference? Look at what Wiseman said. He talks about it as the most important political event in the whole history of the Zionist movement, and no exaggeration to say in the whole history of the people since the exile. I am not exaggerating the importance of the San Remo decision. Five powers who have title can give it, turn around and give to the Jewish people, Palestine, give to the Arabs, Mesopotamia, Iraq, the new name, Syria, and Lebanon. Treaty of Sev comes out of the conference. Shortly after, August, look at what's in the treaty. Article 132. Who does Turkey give the territories to? If we don't have this, then this is not a legal conclusion. It's just another political assertion an allegation, title given by the Turks to the five powers, meaning they can give title to others. And the treaty in Article 95 picks up the wording of the Balfour Declaration, international treaty. The Mandate for Palestine. In the preamble of the ma Mandate for Palestine of December 1920, very important that you know that this is not what's in, in the, the document. Look, <coughs> look at the opening paragraph of the preamble. It refers to the fact that by Article 132 of the Treaty with Turkey, title is given by the powers, to the powers, to the principal powers. Uh, this preamble was drafted, according to what I've been reading, by our Arthur Balfour. Another connection to Balfour. And Article 25, please note the original Article 25. You know, my story about the British, it's a story of an involvement which leads me to the conclusion about the, the good, the bad, and the ugly. It started so well. And I think the good question still is, but for the Balfour Declaration would have stayed have resulted, a Jewish state have resulted. It's a good question, but the British did so much to scuttle, to prevent 
the implementation of the Balfour Declaration. I have no time to tell you when. But Article 25 in the current mandate is the one that gives the British the right to, to, take, to partition Palestine and take away. But the original article did not. You should know that. Now, here's the preamble, uh, the key article of the mandate for Palestine. It takes the wording of the Balfour Declaration and makes it international right, international obligation for the parties involved. If you look at the mandate for Palestine, I believe there are 17 references to the Jewish people and one reference to the Arabs. And that's in the connection with the languages to be spoken in, in, in that country. The whole idea of the, of, the, of the mandate was that there was a territory given to the Jewish people, given in trust to the British, well, in fact, given in trust to the League of Nations who delegated to the British the obligations of mandatories. The Jewish people were supposed to be the beneficiaries of all of that land. The preamble of the, of the mandate, the revised preamble, has the words introduced by Balfour with the recognition of the historical connection and the right to reconstitute. And when I focus on Jerusalem, I say, do you really mean that you're going to use the green line, which is an armistice line, and take away the entirety of the old city of Jerusalem because it's beyond the green line, and you've respected the obligation to the Jews to reconstitute what they used to have? Nonsense. Who can take a position like that and defend it? You know, I, I looked for a long time for the original mandate for Palestine. I don't know if it's by design, but it took the archives in London months to find the original because it was tucked away under the mandate for East Africa, Togoland, and Cameroon. <laughs> but I found it. The head archivist, the lady who'd been there forever, you know, it was pulling out her hair. She, she couldn't go to sleep at night because she couldn't find the original mandate in the archives in London. It had to be there somewhere. We found it. Um, so, let me start my conclusion. Here's the way it was. The mandate covered all of Palestine, both sides of the Jordan River. Uh, oh, by the way, uh, in, in, in September of 1922, after the, the Cairo conference, the British present a memo to the League of Nations about the partition of, of, of that land, two-thirds to be given to not the Arab inhabitants, but to the Ashamites, who came from another part of the Middle East. And uh, the British undertake to honor certain provisions that, not, that, that are still valid in Transjordan. And certain provisions won't apply, but that's the Article 25 that replaced the original Article 25. But you notice that Article 15, 16, and 18 are supposed to continue to be binding and effective even in Transjordan. What's Article 15? It's about no discrimination of any kind uh, in, because of religion, race, or language. That was supposed to be honored in Transjordan under the care of the Guardian, the British. Do you think it was? And today, there's a suggestion, there's a movement by the nations whereby we're going to take away the, a huge chunk of territory and no Jews will be allowed there. They'll be like Gaza. They'll be like Jordan today. We're going to have a proposal, a serious proposal of resolving the issues right now on the basis of, I'm not even talking about sovereignty, a situation where the Jews can't even be there? Well, if Article 15 was applicable in Transjordan, do you think it's applicable in what's left of Palestine? Please give me the argument that justifies such an absurd conclusion. Article 16 was protected. That's been disregarded. And oh, by the way, there's a very wonderful map I found in the League of Nations, which shows what happened you know, uh, within Palestine 
an Arab state has been created. There were no Palestinians in those days, there were Arabs and Jews. And the result of the partition is the creation of an Arab state in Palestine. That's what the map says. So what we're talking about today is the creation of another Arab state within Palestine, but this time on the west side of the Jordan River. Look, within Palestine. Why are these maps not being circulated? Why is this information not presented on a regular basis to members of the Council, the Security Council of the United Nations? So here, after partition, here's what's left. Treaty of Lausanne <coughs> is the final treaty with Turkey because it didn't ratify the Treaty of Sev, but it's exceedingly relevant. Never forget that whatever the Treaty of Lausanne did, all the provisions relating to Palestine, Iraq, Lebanon, Syria were not altered between that treaty and the final Treaty of Lausanne. UN Charter. My friends have already made reference to Article 30, Article 80, and uh, I won't focus on that. Just want to emphasize that the partition resolution was a resolution of the General Assembly that these are not binding in international law. If after the partition resolution was uh, presented to the parties, uh, Arabs and Jews had made a, a, an arrangement, an agreement, and a peace treaty had been signed, then it would have been a source of rights and obligations, but not the partition resolution. Article 80 has been mentioned. Here's the partition. So the birth of the State of Israel, I've, I've sort of run out of time, but I'll say this. If you look at the wording of the... Um, the Declaration of Independence. Uh, I really wish I'd been close to Ben Gurion in those days because he, he refers to historic rights. He refers to uh, partition resolution. I just finished telling you that that legally is not significant. But he doesn't refer to the fact that the historic rights have already been recognized, granted. In French, we say chose jugé. In common law, in British, Terms, res judicata, it's done, decided. So one of the difficulties is, is that uh, there's been a, a lack of understanding and knowledge concerning what I've outlined very quickly. Usually I take about an hour, an hour and a half to do what I've just done. And uh, so this is a survey. The conclusion is this. Based on my studies, based on this heavy book I've got down here, the Jewish people, the Israelis, have the right to be everywhere in the land that was covered in the map. <laughs> approved by uh, Lord George and later used by the French. When the British were trying to get more land up uh, where uh, Syria and Lebanon was, the French said, oh no, we agreed to map 34. This is the map that guides our negotiations. So. Um, I, I think uh, I probably covered enough in, in, in the time, but I'd be glad to answer questions if we have time. Thank you.